Oh, hey Bio30s, hopefully everyone's hanging in there. Today, we're gonna to be starting a new unit. We are going to be talking about genetics. So, let's get into it. To begin, genetics is simply the study of inherited traits or characteristics. So, for example, why do you have blue eyes? Why do you have brown eyes? Why are your lobes attached? Why are your lobes detached? Things like that. That can be boiled down into genetics. And when we talk about genetics, we often refer to this guy right here, Gregor Mendel, as the father of genetics. So, who was Gregor Mendel? Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. He was a failed sorry, he was a failed mathematician. So, as most people did back then, you go into mathematics, you fail at mathematics, backup plan is to become a monk. So obviously I'm joking, but yes, being a monk was his backup plan apparently. And while he was there, he studied inheritance in pea plants. So he looked at pea plants and discovered that, hey, this one has this trait, this one has this trait. If I mix these two together, oh, they get this trait. Or if I mix these two together, they get this trait. And then he developed these laws of inheritance. Now, the interesting thing about Mendel's work is, while very, very important and groundbreaking, it wasn't until the 20th century that it was actually kind of widely recognized as, oh, well, that's how that works. Now, he theorized that traits could be passed through particles, right? So you get particles from mom and dad that gave you your traits. Now, he was close. What he didn't know were the particles were chromosomes, and inside the chromosomes is, of course, DNA. So he was pretty close, though. Now, he came up with some hypotheses. Hypothesis number one was there are alternate forms of a gene. So for example, a flower can be purple or it can be white. So there's variation amongst genes that we call alleles. For each inherited characteristic, an organism has two genes, one from each parent, right? One from mom and one from dad. They may be the same, so purple, purple, or white, white, or they might be different, one purple and one white. Number three, he said that the sperm or the egg will only carry one allele for each trait because they separate or segregate during meiosis. So we know this as the law of segregation. So one trait goes over here to this sperm, one trait goes over here to this sperm. So they separate or segregate. Then when they unite at fertilization, we restore that paired condition and how those two traits interact give you what's called your phenotype. When two genes of a pair are different, like I said with that interacting, one will have an expressed effect and one will have no noticeable effect. We call this dominance and recess. We call this the law of dominance. So one trait will be dominant to the other. So purple could be dominant to white. So if you're purple, purple, that's a purple flower. If you're white, white, it's a white flower. If you're purple and a white, mix them together, it's still gonna be purple even though there's a white allele. Now, why peas? Why was he just so enthralled with peas? Well, I don't know if he's enthralled with peas, but he spent a lot of time with them. They were a great test subject because one, you don't need that big of an area. You can actually go visit Gregor Mendel's garden um, and actually see where he did his experiment. Um, two, they produce a lot of offspring. So you just need a small plot of area to grow peas, but they give you a ton of offspring. They grow really, really fast and they're able to self-pollinate or can be artificially cross-pollinated. And this was very important for him because the pea plants could self-pollinate themselves. So you could give a plant a certain amount of traits without needing another plant. Also, you could artificially take pollen from this plant with these traits, put it in with this plant with different traits and see what happens to the next generation. So we did a ton of experiments, got a ton of ratios and came up with some laws and probabilities related to genetics. Now, what I want to do here is let's get into some terminology. It's very, very important we not we uh, we kind of get this term that terminology knocked down um, or locked down, I suppose, before we move forward with punnett squares and how we actually do these problems. So, number one, a trait. What is a trait? It's any characteristic that can be, that can be passed on from a parent to their offspring. Heredity. This is the process of passing on traits to offspring. And genetics is simply the study of heredity. So simply put, genetics is the study of traits 
being passed from parents to their offspring. So kind of some basic terminology there. Now, when we talk about crosses, you only need to worry about two types of crosses for this course. There's the monohybrid cross and the dihybrid cross. Monohybrid crosses involve a single trait. So a flower color, eye color, hair color, height, um, there's one singular trait you're looking at. A dihybrid cross will be two traits which are unrelated. So the color of the flower and their height. So what are the chances that we take a purple flower that's tall, mix it with a white flower that's short, what happens? So a monohybrid cross, which we're gonna be talking about today, being a singular trait, and then a dihybrid cross being two traits. Now, let's get into alleles. Each gene can have varying forms. This is called an allele. Normally there's a dominant or a recessive, but with most things, there's always exceptions to the rule. And we'll talk about those exceptions in the form of co-dominance, incomplete dominance. There can be multiple alleles, so more than two. Um, <clears throat> dominant or recessive, a dominant allele is basically the stronger of the two genes. So it will show through when we get a mixed genotype and I'll tell you, talk to you about genotypes and phenotypes in a second. So when we have what's called a hybrid, so one of each, the stronger allele shows through, so the dominant allele will show through. And we represent the dominant allele, this is very important, we represent the dominant allele with a capital letter. So a capital letter, you can choose any letter you want, my recommendation is always choose letters that look different when they're capital or lowercase, right? If you're choosing S's, Sometimes you're writing them and they kind of look the same, right? They kind of look very, very similar, depending on the size and things like that. But if you choose, I guess highlighter doesn't really work there. Let me go with pen. So, right, if you choose like H's, there's a distinct difference between dominant and recessive. If you choose R's, there's a distinct difference. So you don't have to, you can pick whatever letter you want. Just know the capital letter represents dominant and the lowercase letter will then represent recessive. So the lowercase letter will be your recessive trait. Okay, genotype and phenotype. Like I said, genotype is your gene combination. You cannot see your genotype. This is inside of your DNA. You cannot see your genotype. You can guess what your genotype is based on your phenotype, which you can physically see sometimes. Um, but your genotype is your gene combination. So for example, you might be double dominant, dominant recessive, or double recessive. And it is your genotype, which you inherit from your parents, that determines your phenotype, which is the physical feature. So for example, red or white, depending on your genotype. So your genotype will always give you your phenotype. However, you cannot see your genotype. Phenotype you can. Phenotype you can see the physical characteristics. In terms of genotypes, there's three genotypes we talked about. Um, there's homozygous heterozygous, and between the two homozygous, or sorry, in homozygous, there's two different types. There's homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So homozygous means the same. So we can have homozygous dominant, meaning you are a double dominant genotype. So you have one big R, one big R. We can have homozygous recessive, which is two recessive, two little Rs, and we often refer to this as a true breeding or pure breeding um, individual. Heterozygous, on the other hand, is then one dominant, one recessive, so big R, little r, and we refer to them as hybrids, so a mixture of the two. And this would be where the rules come into play, because if you're big R, little r, you show the dominant trait over the recessive trait. So homozygous dominant or recessive or heterozygous would be the three genotypes that you could be. Now, let's talk about the generation gap, and then I'll do a little example for you, Dan. The generation gap says that we're gonna have varying generations, right? So we're gonna have a parental generation, and then their offspring, then those offsprings, offspring, and it kind of goes down the line of lineage. So when you see something, say, that's titled P1, it's referring to the parents in that breeding experiment. So it's a P1 cross, you're crossing the parents to produce the F1 generation, which stands for the first phylum. If you then do an F1 cross, you are then crossing two individuals of the first phyla to produce an F2 generation known as the second phyla. So a P1 cross, remember, would be crossing the parents. 
an F1 cross would then be crossing the offspring to get you a next generation, the F2 generation. So be very careful when you do that. When you do a cross, you're gonna end up with ratios. So for example, a genotype ratio will be expressed as homozygous dominant to heterozygous to homozygous recessive. So for example, a genotype ratio might be, we have one double dominant, two hybrids, oops, two hybrids, jump ahead there, and then one double recessive. That would be a regular genotype ratio you would see. A phenotype ratio would then be expressed as dominant to recessive. So for example, we might have three dominant individuals, one recessive, or we might have two dominant individuals, two recessive, which we could then boil down to a one-to-one -one relationship in lowest terms. So I do want you guys to put these um, ratios in lowest terms, um, but if you don't, it's not a big deal. Like for example, if you end up here with a, oh, what would this be? We could do, two to four to two, right? And then if you divided them all by two, you get a one to two to one. Both of them are the same thing. I would just prefer that you put it like this, the lowest terms. Okay, so putting it all together here, here are our four flowers, right? So these could be the four offspring from across. Their phenotype, purple, 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 white, giving us a ratio of, of course, three to one three dominant individuals, one white. We could then add in some percentages. So for example, 75% were purple, 25% were white. Let's go to the genotype. Genotype has one homozygous dominant, 25%, two heterozygous, 50%, and one homozygous recessive, 25%, giving us a ratio of one to two to one. Okay, let's do an example here. Let's say we're doing a cross for seed shapes. This would be a monohybrid cross. This is a P1 monohybrid cross. So to set up my monohybrid cross, what I would do is I would look at the parent's genotypes. I have double dominant and double recessive. So I take the homozygous dominant. All right, I'm gonna write on the top of my Punnett square. Then I'm going to take my next genotype, homozygous recessive, write it on the side of my Punnett square fill it in so I get a two by two. So now I have my four boxes. And all I'm gonna do is match up the alleles. So I match up the alleles, whoops. Match up the alleles. Always write your dominant first. And if we were to say, what is the um, ratio here? Well, it's quite easy. It's 100% hybrid, right? So they're 100% hybrid round seeds, but if we were to put this in a ratio, it'd be a zero to four to zero ratio to zero, one, zero, and then our phenotype ratio would be four to zero, which is essentially a one to zero, right? Because we have all four individuals being round or all four individuals being hybrids. So let's do a F1 cross. So if we do an F1 cross here, we're going to cross the individuals we just produced. So we're going to take a hybrid and cross it with a hybrid. So we're going to take hybrid genotype, hybrid genotype, make our punnet square. And now this is where I have to be careful matching up our alleles to make sure we get them correct. This leaves us with a new ratio. For genotype ratio, we have one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. So this would be our genotype ratio. Our phenotype ratio would still be three to, would, I guess not still be, but would, would be three to one because we have three dominant and one recessive. So that's how you would do a monohybrid cross. Best thing you can do with these is just get some practice because the, pra the more practice you do, the easier these crosses are. The more you practice, right? Half the battle is just trying to understand what the question is asking. Once you understand it, the math and the actual process is not too difficult. It's more the understanding and making sure that you're getting the ratios correct. Now, the last thing I wanna end off here is, what if you have an individual with an unknown genotype? Like say, for example, we had sheep. 
all right? Let's say, for example, we had sheep, and we knew that an individual is homozygous recessive. We know that an individual is homozygous recessive because they're always going to have the little r, little r, or double recessive genotype. And we can always see their phenotype. They have the recessive phenotype. But if we go back to my flower example here, how do we know this flower is heterozygous and this one's homozygous? The answer is we don't, right? We cannot do that just looking at it. We can see that they're both purple, but we have no way of telling heterozygous or homozygous unless we do one of two things. Number one, we can check the parents. So we can do a little pedigree analysis. Or number two, we can do what's called a test cross. So here's what a test cross is, okay? Let's say, for example, we have two sheep, all right? So we have two sheep. We have one that's white, but we don't know if it is homozygous or it's heterozygous. We do have, what, however, a black sheep that we know is homozygous recessive. So what we would do is we would mix the two sheeps together and based on the offspring would give us that sheep's genotype. Well, how would that be? Well, let's say for example, we mix the two sheeps, okay? And if the sheep was homozygous dominant, you would have 100% of the sheep being hybrids and they would all be white. So if all the sheep came out white, pretty good chance that that is a homozygous dominant sheep. But if the sheep was a hybrid, then there is a 50% chance that they're white, but there's also a 50% chance that you get some black sheep as well, which would lead you to the belief that the only way to get a black sheep in this case is if that sheep was a hybrid or heterozygous. So that's called a test cross. When it comes to probability, whoops, when it comes to probability, oh, let's just turn that off there. So when it comes to probability, the important thing to remember is, one, we need to look at the event itself. So you wanna look at the outcomes over the total number of outcomes. So for example, there's four outcomes, we get two, two out of four, 50%. And number two, we need to look at outcomes that are separate of one another. So if I said, is the sheep male or female, we need to treat that as a separate cross. So yes, there's a 50% chance that it's going to be a white sheep, but if I wanted to know what are the chances it's a white male sheep, what I then need to do is take 50%, multiply by 50%, which gives me one quarter. So now there's a 25% chance that it's a male sheep with white fur. So there are two separate prob probability events. Let's get rid of that quick. So there's two separate probability events, meaning we need to treat them as such. All right? So that's all I have for you today. i to stop touching that. Um, next lesson, we are going to discuss some exemptions to the rule. So we're going to talk about, well, what if it's not complete dominance? What if one allele doesn't mask the other? So we're going to talk about co-dominance, incomplete dominance, and also what happens if there's more than two alleles. So thanks again for watching and we'll chat soon.